Good afternoon. 大家好啊，唔忙。Good afternoon. I'm Ian, and I'm the committee member of Social Enterprise Summit. So welcome everyone, and I'm very happy to see you all. So early this year, when our committee confirmed the topic of art innovations, and I'm the person to invite guests from overseas and in Hong Kong, I was thinking the definition of art innovations. So to me, art is not a tool to evoke our senses, and art also holds a mirror up to people to help them rethink and reimagine our society. So how art lead to social improvement, bringing new thinking and possibilities to our society? What models we can use to find ways to continue the pos positive influence of art? So this is why we are here today. So we are honored to present Picture, Creative Space Development Director of Thailand Creative Design Center. <laughs> you. <laughs> and Connie, Executive Director of Hong Kong Art Center. <laughs> and Felix, Executive Board Member of Little Sun Foundation, to share their <laughs> exciting words and experience with us. So afterwards, we will have panel discussion and Q&A sessions in which you will have the chance to learn more from these interesting people and talented people. So our first guest is Felix from Little Sun Foundation. Let's welcome him. Thank you very much. Yes. And I press the button. Yes. So it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I'm speaking a little bit from um, you know, an intermediary space uh, coming from art and culture and going towards um, social business. Um, I am a, a, the executive board member currently of Little Sun Foundation, which is our nonprofit branch for the Little Sun Project. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit of time. But um, I also have been for the past 13 years working in the arts with artist Olafur Eliasson, who is one of our, our founders for this project. And I thought I would bring you into that very briefly, just with a few slides on artworks of his that also have to do with, um, partly with a global mission and a global idea of how we picture our world and how we can influence and ideally also um, shape it. So um, one thing is, even with our little lamps, we always try to engage audiences. And you could say that that is uh, something we've taken from arts and culture and are employing in this little social adventure. And the image you see here is um, of a, a concert that happened at Carnegie Hall um, in New York uh, a year ago, roughly. And it was staged by a few um, musicians, artists who believe that climate change is very real, something has to be done against it. And it's called the Pathway to Paris um, concert, um, basically trying to use arts, music, creativity to lobby for the Paris um, climate accords to be kept. This was especially relevant at a time in the US, of course, under President Trump, when that is not anymore something that's a given. And uh, there was an audience engagement activity. Every member of the audience received a little sun on their chair, similarly to what we did um, yesterday evening at, at the dinner. And, uh, and everyone performed a sunrise together. And interestingly, this was coming from, um, uh, from, from the arts, not from the musicians. And it was you know, more of an activity for the audience than, than actually listening. So, so it activated everyone. And um, we come from a space, or Olafur um, Eliasson, the artist who is behind our, our design, come from a space where art is very much about opening museums to be spaces that are about social issues, about questions. This is probably Olafur's uh, most well-known art piece. It was um, an installation at, um, in London at Tate Modern's Turbine Hall, a huge um, former um, electrical facility, huge building. And uh, he installed a gigantic sun into, into that space. It looks like a complete sun. It was actually half a sun and a mirror ceiling. And um, so you see people lying on the floor there. That's because they can see themselves in the ceiling. And this was very much in the idea of, um, of creating a, a, rather unique, um, a rather unique space within the art world for people to see their surroundings differently, to reflect the fact that they're actually a part of this installation. They're a part of this activity. 
And this idea of engagement, the idea that your engagement in the world has consequences, and that through art we can make that more visible to people potentially is important and that carries I think through, through to what we um, do at Little Sun. Other artworks, larger artworks of Olofors have included uh, artificial waterfalls, for example this one under the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. Um, it has included, instead of just putting a landscape painting into a museum, actually bringing a landscape into the museum. This was at Louisiana Museum in Denmark two or three years ago I think. An Icelandic landscape, a small river leading through the museum giving people a physical experience of walking over lava, rocks, and, and actually traversing a museum in a different way. And it's this idea of immersion in environments that I think is quite important. It's something that art and culture can offer in different ways than many other segments um, of our societies. Olafur has also done art pieces that relate very directly to climate change. This was actually during the Paris um, Climate Conference on um, a public, um, public place in Paris. Uh, glacial ice blocks taken from, uh, from fjords in Greenland after they had dropped off of the glacier, so we didn't pick them off, and put there as a really active sensation of ice melting. So we all know the ice caps are melting, but what does that actually mean and how does it relate to us? So if you get an instance where people can actually hug an ice block and see it melt away, it creates a very different form of, of, of that perception. It's a much more direct experience. And I think this idea of direct experience and engagement leads me to, to our social venture, Little Sun. So um, we have a rather simple vision. It's basically the same as the, the sustainable development goal number seven, and that is universal access to clean energy for all of us. We for sure need that. Everyone who doesn't have access to energy needs access. All of us that use uh, non-renewable energy for sure should shift to renewable energy if we really want to change the world. So we are very strongly working towards these 2030 goals of um, mapped out in the SDGs. Um, as said, SDG 7, that's our core SDG, you could say, the one highlighted. But we also, with Little Sun, address uh, a few others. There is um, no poverty because we bring these lamps ideally to places in the world where there is no access to electricity and where poverty is a big topic. Good health, I, I will explain that a bit. Um, quality education, light is very much about seeing, and climate action. So that relates back to the, the advocacy um, idea. So our mainframe, what do we actually do at Little Sun? We create small solar powered lamps, and we started creating these largely um, targeting the 1.1 billion people in the world who do not have access to energy. Something we in this room cannot actually imagine. Every camera that is clicking has to be charged. Every phone, I have like five devices on me that require energy. Um, this one you can charge with one day of sunlight. So you put the sun in the back, you have light for a night. Super simple, the smallest sensible form of solar energy use, 0 0.5 watts, not very strong, but able to make a difference in a child's life, for example. So what we do is we sell these lamps at a higher price in the global north and at a subsidized price in some countries in the global south. We're a tiny organization, so we are largely active only in a few countries in sub-Saharan Africa not because we feel other places in the world would not be relevant, but because, again, we're tiny, we had to start somewhere, and Ethiopia was our starting point. So this is Hasna, a girl in uh, rural Ethiopia in the Afar um, region, and we um, met her through an NGO who was working in her region, Save the Children, who actually distributed um, a solar lamp to her in a program that was targeting rural school kids in Ethiopia. Um, this was not a social business distribution, this was actually uh, an NGO, nonprofit distribution, which we also do. The fact is, Hasna lives in an environment where there's no energy in her home space. That means light is provided either through burning wood or through burning kerosene, which um, emits toxic fumes, costs actually a lot of money, especially for people who don't have any money, which is hazardous to environment, to health, and delivers terrible um, lighting. And so one little solar lamp can actually change how this family can deal with their life. For Hasna, it means she can do her homework. It means she can safely um, herd her sheep in the nighttime. For her grandfather, it means he can go to the bathroom during the night without breaking a leg, which would basically be a death sentence to him because there is no medical um, service nearby. So for me, coming from Germany, it's super hard to imagine the impact of this. But it's, it's very real and it's, it's, it's very important. What we try to do is we try to do this in a positive way. So this is a school class in, um, in South Africa. And, you know, we're not about aid and charity in a stigmatizing way. We're very much about holding hands and doing something fun and powerful together. We work um, 
also in context of refugees, displacement, unfortunately, also a growing, um, a growing scenario in the world. So this was um, in the Somali region um, of Ethiopia, a distribution that we did together with, um, goodness, I think it was UNHCR. No, sorry, IOM, International Organization of Migration. Um, so what we've learned through this project coming from the arts, coming from almost the Western art world, so a very closed, very small segment, is how are the mechanics of the larger world? So to me, this has been an incredibly interesting project. It's super interesting for me to be here and talking to you because social business, usually if you're within the closed art world, is also not exactly what you are looking at. Um, so we learned the mechanics, you know, how does UNHCR work? How does the humanitarian sector work? We learned how does business work? So, you know, this is a truck delivering our lights to our uh, distributor's warehouse in, in Ethiopia. We tried to figure out how do we set up social business, micro business. These are a few uh, colleagues of ours in, um, in Tanzania who are trying to do a little bit of retail. And you can see from the packaging, it's very different of the lamps from what we have now. So this is a few years ago already. And essentially throughout the years, we've worked with these different strands. We've tried to work in social business. We've tried to work with humanitarian partners. We've tried to work with uh, business in the global north always to create ideally a scalable solution to delivering clean energy access for all, with the starting point being the small palpable little lamp. Um, so far we've um, impacted around 1.5 million people in sub-Saharan Africa with the lamps, which we think is great, but it's also only a beginning. One interesting thing that we realized in the process is um, that our story works really, really well in the global north. This is um, a big department store in, in Berlin who gave us a, a huge corner window to decorate, not because they make so much money selling our lamps, but because they really love the idea of the impact project. These are colleagues of mine at a festival, uh, again in Germany, lobbying for sustainable energy, telling our story and, and meeting people. And it's very much about this idea of, of positive engagement, which I think is so important for, for social business also. We can tell a story, all of us together, and that is one of positive change. And this story is falling on more fertile grounds basically every year. I've seen that increase in the number of, um, of applications we get from kids, millennials, who are suddenly believing that they really want to impact the world in a different way. And that gives me some hope. You know, the news otherwise tends to, tends to sound dismal. Um, but I think there is an opportunity here. And I think social business is actually a really, really big leveraging power for that. And uh, we'll talk about B Corp, I think, also. So, so it's interesting. There are more and more organizations, more and more people that think it's relevant that we do something in a very different way. Little Sun has become a symbol. This is an image from uh, the climate conference um, in Marrakesh in 2016, United Nations Climate Conference. And all the delegates received a lamp uh, courtesy of the French Minister of Energy in that year. And they, again, did a sunrise together. So it was really, you know, all the delegates of all countries represented there sharing a light, sharing a belief that they can hold renewable energy in their hands, and sharing in this idea that it's quite simple to, you know, pull the sun down from the sky and make it something we can actually use as a tool. And coming from the arts, we're quite excited that, that we can furnish this tool, that we can put a tool out there that we can all touch together. And that's really about this idea of, of sharing. We've moved 500,000 of these lamps to date, and we've kind of mixed you know, the pictures and the stories about that. So it's the climate conference guys, it's the refugee, it's the child, it's the child in Ethiopia, the child in Germany. Potentially, um, I've heard now from a few people, I, I talked already, children here in, in Hong Kong yesterday uh, got lamps as well. And this idea that we're all connected around something, that we're all connected around the possibility of shaping our future, that is what we would like to bring along with this project. So Little Sun is about you know, having fun, drawing with light, being creative and feeling empowered. It's about people doing somewhat uh, odd and crazy things occasionally. This is a small exhibition space in Cameroon where someone interpreted Little Sun as a, you know, in their own way. And uh, essentially it's about doing good, impacting the world, creating sustainable business, and you know, trying to look somehow fantastic in the process. And um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Super brief intro to, to what we do. Check out littlesun.com or littlesunfoundation.org for our two areas of business. If you're interested in Olafur Eliasson, it's olafureliasson.net, the artist behind um, what we're doing also, great guy, very interesting. There's even a small TV station linked in that website. 
where we're trying to bring in current events, bring in discussions about climate, great thinkers, and, and really connect this idea of sharing something in the world, sharing an idea, sharing a vision. So again, I'm very excited to be here. I look forward to the conversation, and uh, thank you. So thank you, Felix. So I suggest everyone can go outside our room to buy at least one little sun lamb. So if you buy one, you can pretend or cosplay Iron Man. And then if you buy two, you can cosplay Mickey Mouse. That's <laughs> picture teach me yesterday. So I think it's time to pass the stage to picture. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Pichit from Thailand Creative and Design Center. What I'm going to talk about this evening maybe is a different story from you just heard just now. So I only have 15 minutes. Thainess, I'm from Thailand. So this is Thainess. For you as a Hong Kong Kian or from China, maybe you see Thailand as Thailand, but this is another point of view that you will see Thailand. Thailand has the, the Eiffel Tower, have the London um, Cucumber building in Bangkok. So this is another view that maybe you can experience Thailand. Um, oh, this is Taipei. <laughs> OK, sorry. Um, this is one of the gimmicks that Thai use for control the traffic, uh, mannequins of, of policemen, which stands ar ar along the street in lots of junctions. So this helps to slow down the traffic, make the driver be more careful when they're driving, lower the speed, things like that. And this is the kind of creativities in, in the locals that they try to find their ways out. Guess what is this? It's a slipper, but it's not a complete slipper because this slipper is for, it's a slipper in a temple so people don't steal it. So you cut it, so it's not, not complete so people won't steal it. This is, this is like, when you go to temple you have to take your, your shoes off, things like that. This is how people creatively find the solutions. These are another kind of toilet slippers in temples. They cut it off so you can tiptoe into the toilet and the slipper won't be st stolen. There's another thing that the Thais enjoy to um, find solutions for, for themselves. This is a queuing system in lots of um, rural areas. There's like because we are not a uh, perfect country, we don't have like apps for for um, up country people to to queue up things like that. So they manage <laughs> to queue themselves up, and this is how they organize the chaos that happens in hospitals. So this is things that happens. We call it a positive chaos, <laughs> which is. The, the foundation of most of the tininess, the humor, and lots of things happening. Looking at the creativity side, um, this is Thailand, mainly is Buddhist, but every, every religion is, is accepted in the kingdom of Thailand, but this is on the issue of <clears throat> Buddhism, which you cannot kill mosquitoes, things like that. There's a designer came up with, with an idea with a nanotechnology. They, they put like um, a mosquito repellent inside the, the fabric and cut it to, for the monks. And this is things to donate to the monk. So they will don't get the mosquito biting at night, things like that. So they're trying to find new ways of, of inventing things. This is a bus in, in 
um, northeast of, of Thailand. They're trying to compete with lots of airlines, lots of um, smaller vans, things like that. So they came up with an, an, an idea of using like a first, first class cabin plane for serve in the bus. So this is quite popular because it's, it's not so expensive, but they could get the comfort that they will be traveling by night. Um, this is another interesting um, project that my friend runs it. Um, it's about, I'm not so sure you have been heard it before, it's, it's called the Unusual Football Field. Um, it's actually it's a partly CSR thing for um, a, a development, a land development, um, something like a condominium, things like that. They actually would like to find a football field and, and try the possibilities to um, CSR building a football field for communities, things like that, in like a, a poor area, but they could not find a, a right side, a right size of the, the football field. So they came up with the idea of the unusual football field, <laughs> which actually could use like a football field. The idea is like in, in, in schools, you have like five teams playing on one field, things like that in the basketball um, court, things like that they could play. So they came up with this idea and blew it to the very end. And this won like numer numerous awards last year. They even won the gold, um, the, the, I think the gold medal of the Lan uh, Lion, Khan's Lion, things like that. So this is an idea that I think it, it could, um, we could pursue for new things to happen in, in, the, in the area. And I think this is one of the good examples for, for the designers and creative in Thailand. Oh, sorry. I skipped. This is another, another project that we um, happens to involve in 2011. There's a great flood from the north to Bangkok. So people were lots, in lots of troubles and the Thai people has never um, involved in this great flood. So they didn't leave their house, things like that. So we, as a design center, we involved with, with the question, how could design impact their life, how we could find solution for them. So they came up with lots of projects using the design thinking, methodologies, things like that to find new things. So it's even have like um, a toilet that you can, it could, it, you, can, you can float the toilet around and people could use it, things like that. Because on dry land you can find toilet, but on, on water you can't find toilet. So they came up with lots of things. This is um, a project for the bus stop. It's, it's maybe weird for you to see developing a bus stop in Bangkok, but Bangkok bus was like, was not great. So this is a very new thing for them to, to try a new bus stop systems and it's working for the people involving everyone, the Bangkok Metropolitan Administration, involving um, lots of people using the bus, things like that, to find a new routes, new way of, of, of a new bus stop that could, could um, engage a new, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, a perfect um, trip for, for people using daily life. So back to, this is part where I work and this is the area which used to be the very Bangkok. This is the first road. It's called Tiran Krung in Bangkok. In English, it's called New Road. So it's the, the first road. And all the civilization in Bangkok start here. But later, um, maybe f the past 30 years, um, everything spread across Bangkok. So this thing, this area, has run down a bit, and this is the building that you see just now, the Grand Postal Building where we are now. And we renovated and reprogram all of the programs in, in the center. This is an 80 years old building. It's a 
postal building where everyone used to come here 80 years ago because to contact with the world, to contact with anything, you have to come here. And this is our center right now. Um, there's a um, library, there's a co-working space, there's material center, things like that. And it's like a public function for, for the people in Bangkok. So before we, we move into this area, we are very new to the neighborhood, so we are not so sure what programs we will fit in. So we create a project called um, Co-Create Children's Room, which involves, I think, around 500 people in the community to ask them what do they need, what do they like to see, what will be the significant change if we are here. So it came up with lots of things, doing lots of things in the area, and they came up with um, five um, test type for them, like using like um, the connecting the riverfront and using, oh sorry, <laughs> um, adapting all the abandoned buildings, more green space, which Bangkok has less green space in the world, I think. Rec um, um, connecting all the alleys, a signage system that will bring people ar 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 along the area. So it came up and we tested even with putting a tree in front of a building and ask them for a and research, interview, things like that. What is it good to have a tree, things like that. And this is other projects like doing a street crossing. Crossing in, in, in Thailand is, is, is dangerous, so it's, it's worse. <laughs> and this is project that we try to came up all the research base, how people cross, how accidents happen, things like that. And we're coming up with a new kind of zebra crossing, things like that, in the area. So we'll test it out in the area, how people cross, how accidents happen. It doesn't, it doesn't happen with the first car. It's always happened with the second car behind coming up. So this is how we are, we are studying, and we are, we are now trying to prototype it. There's a junction this kind in the area, so we are trying to master how to create a, a zebra crossing which is safe for the people in the area. This is other prototypes. So it's coming soon. In two months, it, it will be um, trial on the street. We run a Bangkok Design Week, which um, is a trial of, of how a space apart from all the mass transit could um, uh, bring people together. It's a nine days um, event, maybe lots of people coming in. That's things like creative district project, things like having like a floating park in the river because there's less green space. So we're trying to start a conversation with the government that there's no space. So we have to have a green park in the river. There's users of lots of things happening. I'm running out of time, so I'm a bit faster with showcase programs for people to come and join, markets, things like that. In this project, there's one thing that is the challenge is this is a space further down in the, the alleys and there's no people walking in. So we challenged them with the team of the lighting designers to create like 10 installation in, at the time of the um, design week. So they came up with lots of interactive lighting installations, which help people to walk into the space where normally people won't walk. So there's a new challenge that we try to involve the community, the designers, people to come in to, to engage. The little sun will be great for that. <laughs> you can use your mobile phone to, to draw it. And this is the last project coming up in two months too. This is another side of the area, which is like all the homeless are, are very close. It, it's close to the, the rail um, station. So there's lots of homeless in the area and it's dark and it's no one walks there. So it's a bit dangerous. So we, we are trying to figure out how to um, come up with system that will help people be more safe in the area and and comes and walk more. So this is like an urban night galleries that we are trying to figure it out. There will be lighting 
across the area, actually it's a bit too, too bright, so you don't see. This is the canal, and there will be lighting, things like that, so people will come and walk around at the area, so there will be things that people could enjoy coming to, to the area and develop with, with the communities, because when this thing happens, people come, there will be snowball effects on selling other things because people could sell in the design week, people on the, the path to the design week, they sell drinks, they sell um, t-shirts, they sell everything. So there's a ripple effect that happen along the way. You just have to put something at the very end as, as a destination. And along the way, there will be organic happening on, on, the, on the programs. So this is maybe a short 15 minutes presentation, and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Fisher. And our next guest is Connie. But before that, I would like to have a quick survey first. So just want to ask any one of you coming from Hong Kong, raise your hand, please. OK, so I have one well, most of us. So I think it's time to pass the stage to Connie and explain <laughs> how you operate the Hong Kong Art Center. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the organizations and particularly thank you Ian because uh, I think um, he is really have a good job, good selections because um, from Felix and to me and then three of us are, are very different. So what we cover, as, as different stories. So that's really make this um, conference is much more interesting. So um, I, I know that there's like a, a lot of you is from Hong Kong, but I still want to steal you a few minutes uh, to show a video about uh, Hong Kong Art Center. And as I, I think um, Art Center is quite difficult to use a few words to describe. And a lot of people might only see one phase of Hong Kong Art Center. Yes. Actually,中心意念上是一個民間的團體 很多時候阿生提供一個場地可以給一部非主流的電影可以這樣去播放是對很多創作人、很多導演做了這個作品都可以在影院度一個播放一個集體的觀影這是一個很重要的一件事情 People give funding to the IFBA, all about us. They can present new future of young youth. I believe the young youth have a great talent. They just need one chance to come up.
有啲真係灣仔街坊嚟嘅，或者係灣仔工作嘅人，佢話誒好開心嘅，因為每日誒、呃、都會經過，然後每日都會見到咁樣。You know, rent is very expensive. Um, I think it's essential to help artists um, here be able to show their work, exhibit their work. You know, what I enjoyed most about Comics Home Base was the crowd, that all kinds of people came to the exhibition, all walks of life. I do think that this art school and this program um, gives you a lot more flexibility and everyone is very helpful and I think it's kind of more contemporary and modern and in the time now. Thank you for your time. Is I think is this video can illustrate is our center. So I have to be very thankful for our pioneers as, um, in the late uh, 60s, last centuries, late 60s, that uh, they have uh, ideas to have an art center which is not run by the Hong Kong government, and that they lobby the government to get the land, and then uh, they raise funds to build this building. And, and then uh, our center do not receive recurrent funding from the government, but I have to say as like uh, having the land is something uh, already very grateful because we have our own building. Um, this is our building, it's just across the street. So totally we have the 19 stories and, and, and then it's like we have facilities and also we get space. So we are more like a art, uh, vertical artist village because we have uh, different art organizations, um, also creative uh, talents uh, stay in it. So our major income is uh, through rent. Uh, you can, uh, because uh, we are a statutory body, so when you go to our website, you can see our expenditures and also income. Mm. And then our major income is from the rent, but even the rent is not enough. Uh, you can go back to this, our rent is not enough. We have to do a lot of things. So I have been very thankful that I have a very good team. We all have visions because we think arts can change the society. So, um, and, and I think this is really important is like, um, what makes arts is so important to the society and how we think how arts can uh, make an impact uh, to the society. A uh, lot of our project is uh, bottom up, it's not um, from the top down. So this is also uh, one of very important um, phenomena or DNA in our, in our center. For us, this art is not about the end products, but the process of thinking and interacting. So a lot of people thinking arts just about the end product, but to us, it's the process is the most important. So uh, I think it's like, uh, this is more like our um, thinking model is uh, when we do a work at uh, Contemporary Arts, it's about critical thinking, and we have a lot of dialogues, discourse, and also we have to involve creativities, and also we have to meet the social needs. I think uh, the previous uh, speakers has also engaged with what we, uh, we I want to cover. 
and and then also is like a arts, contemporary arts, and all whatever we what we want to do is is to meet what is the most important things at this moment. But to a lot of people, um, they have different um, interests. So we have to think about what type of interest. You know, our center is quite greedy. When you see the video, you see we, are, we have a diverse spectrum. So, uh, and that means that I have different teams who have, they have different interests. They might want to promote media arts. But in the media arts, they are thinking about how to get across to general public. So this is uh, one thing. But the other, they have different concerns. For example, we have a cinema. Of course, we do a lot of arts, arts film screenings, but I, we don't want to limit to that. So nine years ago, we start our um, deaf film cinema. So we are the only place in Hong Kong to serve the he hearing impaired. So this is not only an entertainment for them, a gathering place, but also an international uh, discussion platform. Um, and this is also a training ground. So, um, so we come across for this, for this festival, we have uh, deaf theme screenings and also seminar. We are very excited, uh, I, we are very grateful that it's like uh, we have different collaborators because we can't to, to do it. So we have to thankful for the association of, of the deaf uh, that they provide a, a lot of um, support to make these things happen. You know, it's in the art world, it's like uh, we can't uh, think what we can solve all problems. We can't because we need other partners to help us to solve things. And, and, and also, um, when we start the first uh, festival, is we are very green. We, in Hong Kong, there's no uh, film, deaf film makers. Uh, so that's why we have to have workshops, we work with universities, and we do trainings. So gradually, after nine years, as, uh, we have uh, some um, filmmakers come up. But, um, but you know that, I don't know if you know uh, who is Mox Hill Yu. Uh, when we start to this uh, festival, what is our dream? We have a vision. We hope one day, Hong Kong, just like in Japan or in UK, the hearing impaired person can really work in the film industry. I'm not sure have you come across that it's a film uh, quite sometimes uh, have been uh, shown in Hong Kong, particularly in our art center cinema. The film uh, is made by a, a hearing impaired film director in Japan. So the, um, the, uh, the story is about a hearing person marry a uh, hearing impaired uh, wife. So this is uh, talking about the, the story of the families. At, at that time, we showed this, uh, uh, to me, at that time when we uh, select to show this film in our cinema because this is uh, something um, touch our heart. First of all, it's not much, uh, even there is cinema, it's uh, stories or films about a hearing impaired person, mostly it's uh, directed by hearing people, but not someone is hearing impaired. And it's not apart from the director, but uh, the, uh, the lighting man is also hearing impaired. So this is something is our ultimate goal. At one day in Hong Kong, we will have film crew who is, even they have like a hearing impaired, but they can really work together to make their own um, commercial film. So this is something uh, will be very um, great for Hong Kong. And we've seen this type of um, professionals have been involving in Japan and UK, but there's not a lot of big production, but at least they can uh, stand alone by themselves. So, um, and, and also this film festival, we are also can connecting the hearing people and the hearing, with hearing impaired person, because we are not invite, we, this uh, festival is not uh, only uh, showing films just for the hearing impaired person because we have discussed with the hearing impaired person is that they want the hearing people come to see the film. They want them to understand their culture and also their world. So this is a way of communications and this is really important to us. So that's why we have discussions. You know, um, before I, we work on this uh, festival, we have some lousy thoughts. We think sign language is universal. Actually, it's not. Even in Hong Kong, there is three kinds of sign languages. And then it's like a UK have one sign languages, Japan have one. So whenever we do forum, we have 
right now you see a, a sign language uh, interpreter with that. We have a few sitting in front because we have different audience. So that's why we have different sign languages. So I, I think this is another thing. Um, if we want to uh, serve the different communities, we have to know them. So, so uh, through these festivals, uh, my colleagues and I have um, learned a lot of experience. As uh, if we want to serve uh, the different communities, uh, we have to. We really have to uh, spend time and engage with them, and also let them to voice out. And this is really important. And also, it's very important. We have we need great partners. Without these partners, so as funding issues and also technical issues, and and of course, our center can provide values and administrative and creativities. But we need partners, and this is also very important. Whenever we want to do some something sustainable, we can't do it alone. We need good partners. So we have software hardware and also partners. So uh, I think this is one of the case, uh, the stories I want to tell. And, and then it's like um, um, the limitations, because I don't want to say how good we are. We still have lots of limitations because um, at this point is uh, this year, um, I think it's like starting from the first year, we start to have the film workshops. But uh, this year and last year, we cannot continue uh, to have the film workshops. First of all, is like um, our, one of our partners, um, they have changed their head. So they are no longer very interested about supporting to provide free lecturers, free equipment uh, for making this happen. So we have to drop this idea. And secondly, it's like um, uh, quite a number of uh, filmmakers whom we have raised the hearing impaired uh, um, directors, um, they cannot uh, have one step further because this right now still is amateurs. It cannot be a profession. So, so if in the long run, um, I think we still to look for different partners, maybe uh, to have uh, some funding is really can train them up. So in the future that they can do, become they're really a profession. So this is something we, we have to um, say, this is our shortcomings. So the next stories I want to uh, share with you, uh, is also about uh, some minority groups in Hong Kong. First is is the 80,000 uh, populations of hearing and peers, but the second is like a, a platform of uh, ethnic minorities. I know I only have a one minute, but give me five minutes, I want to complete this. Um, so you can see the chances. Actually, Hong Kong is, um, when we talk about ethnic minorities, you can see Filipino, Indonesia, uh, like white is very general, like, Australians and British, you can understand Indians. So, um, but a lot of time is if if they are uh, middle class, they are much more visible. If they are not middle class, they are deprived. So they are not visible. Uh, when we start to do uh, this project, is called all about us. We are quite shocked. Maybe we live in the Hong Kong islands. So we find a lot of uh, the kids never been to Wan Chai. So we are very shocked. So, so that's why we start to do a lot of things is how we can support these kids that they can have more mobility and also they can gain their self-confidence. And making video is one of the very important uh, 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 ways that they can um, um, articulate themselves. So uh, we, when we involve the, most of our tutors, they are very, uh, because we do the short film awards, so most of our tutors are Hong Kong, like our short film award winners, and they are also famous filmmakers who receive award from the ADC. And I think this is really important: is let the artists have to go to the front line to understand the needs of Hong Kong. So this is also for good for them; they they can see Hong Kong clearly. So this is uh, what we uh, do for our project is like uh, we have a film production camps, creative film showcase, screening and community tours, education kits and, and blogs. Blogs is very important is, is the continuous uh, communications between the tutors and the kids, uh, whoever participates in, in our, in our um, camp. And also that is this blogs is also open to public. So people can really uh, know more about the ethnic minorities uh, in Hong Kong. And we also want uh, partnerships uh, with the, the uh, cultural studies of um, 
uh, Ningnam Cultural Studies, and then we already do some, some uh, publications, and we can distribute uh, to a lot of secondary schools. So in their DSEs, they can uh, 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 share with the uh, Hong Kong students. But anyway, uh, after we see the feedbacks as people right now, it's much more easy to go online. So we stop doing these publications, but really go online to do that. So that's why we have the blog. So these are the partners who are working and it's very important. When we uh, work with this project is a uh, live workshop is really important for us, this partner, because they know the ethnic minorities very well. So uh, because every ethnic minorities uh, groups, they have different uh, religious practices. Uh, and also they have a different lifestyle. So through them, we can understand how to communicate with our uh, participants. So um, this is uh, what we do is, for us, it's, like, uh, it's really important is we have to know who we are working with. I don't think we have the time um, to talk, uh, share about the testimony because if you go to our blog and you can watch it. But one thing I think is really important is like, uh, what is the impact? I think we, uh, what we're doing is not impacting in Hong Kong. We're giving our voices. So actually when we present this project is uh, in one in, in Taiwan once and there is a, a Japanese uh, scholars and, and she spots our project and, and then it's like uh, she invites us and also another Malaysian uh, uh, group to do a research project and then we uh, can, and then is my our uh, alumni can go to Japan and also Malaysia to do the presentations. This is really open up uh, for our um, participants and to them is like a, this is a one funny story um, when we do the presentations in Malaysia is um, at that time uh, our uh, I don't I think she is not yet our chief executive but she is like uh, one of the uh, important government officials and she was there and then she has uh, took photos with our uh, ethnic minority participants to them is something they never expected they really think they can recognize by Hong Kong people because they have the government officials having a photos with them in an international event. So I think what we're doing is like, uh, we cannot change the world. I mean, I mean it's like the societies a lot immediately, but we provide uh, dignity. We try to, and then uh, they have their uh, self initiative and also more important, they also recognize themselves as a Hong Kong citizens. I think this is, uh, and to us, is really important. So uh, I think uh, I have finished my time, and and thank you for for uh, your time, and and hope you have uh, more questions to come up. Thank you. Okay. Time, why, why, testing, testing. Okay, time for the panel discussion. So, okay, maybe I have some questions to Pisha first. Yes, <laughs> I have a lot of questions yeah. to you. And, uh, you know, I just find out that TCDC is actually a government agency, and then your work is directly reported to the Prime Minister. So, can you tell our audience that what is the pros and cons you face when operating TCDC? This is the first question. And then the second one is, I know you not only organize or help incubate social innovation project, you also help them to become a social enterprise. So how do you do that? Can you let our audience know your plan? The pros and cons, um, we are 100% um, funded by the government, so we are a government agency, which um, we look at ourselves as um, an economic agency which uses design and creativity to create growth for the people. And there's lots of upside, the bright side of, of doing this, because as a government, we, uh, we subsidize everything. We have the budget, we come up with projects, things like that, and we run the project for, for the communities or for the industries, things like that. Um, in a way, as a government agency, we could, could not cover everything. That's one of the, the downside. But eventually, we are now coming into the 14th 
year. So it's like we are, we try to cover it yearly. So the people who complained two years ago, maybe this year is 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 that turn that the the industries the cluster will be um, included in the in the programs or in the projects, things like that. The things that we fear most of the time is the political situation in Thailand, which changes along the past decades, I think. And but it doesn't affect that much, but it it. It slowed down things because the government changed. We have to say hi again to all the new government. So it's like it takes lots of, of efforts to introduce ourselves again and again and again. That is part of the pros and cons. On the other side of, of supporting like um, SE or things like um, innovation, things like that, we are not actually. Um, a funding agency so but we are happy to to work with people and and try to support as much as we as much as as we could do so we come up the other way other shortcuts things like if we could not fund them but we could um, direct the project to them so they could they could Come, what, come up with, with things that will help people in a way. So it's like we don't need to, we could not fund them the whole thing, but we are trying to work with them and see what is in line with us and them to achieve the goals. Can you tell us one or two examples? Um, there are projects like, uh, there's lots of projects. <laughs> Like the bus stop. Actually, it's, a, it's an NGO project that tried to work with the Bangkok Metropolitan Administration and they didn't care much. We are a government body, so we try to be a, the platform to, to link them. The NGO didn't have any budget to run it. And we believe that this is a good project that will have impact to people in the city. So in the very beginning, we, we have um, projects, actually the late king who passed away two years ago, there's lots of um, people coming around the country to pay tribute to him. The people who comes to the area doesn't know how to get back to the, the bus station. So this is the very beginning that we, we try to um, connect them, try to fund them on the project, and, and let this thing happen. So this is part of what examples that we could, could, could let you understand. We are not a funding agency, but we do the projects with them and get impacts with, with the social things like that. Thank you, Peter. And Connie, I also have one question to you. Um, yeah, now we all know that Hong Kong Art Center is self-financed, not supported by Hong Kong government. So I just want to know what difficulties do you face when operating the whole organizations? Because that's including business decisions like the rental fee or how you curate the art program. There must be some balance between them. So can you tell us the difficulties you face? Um, I, I think yes, if you work well, in the art field, you always have to have hope. If you always think you're you have a shortage, you cannot go on. So, um, the, so at, it's very interesting is whenever we do the programming, we always based on zero budget. We don't think we have a budget. So we start to do the budgeting. So we have to think, find ways how to get fund. So the major income from the uh, rent is mostly to cover our uh, back end uh, service. For example, uh, uh, most of my uh, colleagues' um, salary but, or, and other maintenance. So whenever we want to do good programs, we have to uh, raise funds to do that. Um, so, so my team is very uh, experienced uh, on writing proposals. So uh, we keep on writing to proposals to different foundations, uh, different uh, funding bodies, and then we also knock doors of, uh, we'll have to look for patrons, and, and you know, it's not every time uh, is successful. But whenever we find something, we have to do it. And, and because we knew a lot of niche things, and 
niche things cannot get sponsored. And sometimes uh, patrons will not understand what you're doing. And for example, street music is uh, one of um, uh, a very good example. When we start to do street music uh, outside of the art centers, uh, we have to uh, use our own money because uh, we think we cannot let the artists do things free. Even the budget might be very humble, but we still have to pay them. So we use our own resources to do it. So I think at, at least after three years' time, we gradually build up our momentum, and, uh, and then we uh, start to get uh, funding from different parties, and gradually we have a six years uh, support from uh, a jockey club, but it's, the project is finished again. So when we start to use our own money and uh, still doing this as, uh, in a, a small scale. So um, the only thing I want to share is, yes, uh, uh, once if you do not receive recurrent funding for the government, but doesn't mean that there is no way out. If you have a good project and you can keep on knocking the doors, you cannot lose, you cannot lose hope because once you lose hope, nothing can done. Okay, so one question to Felix. So um, B2Sun is a B Corp, and uh, can you tell our audience why your board members make the decision to run B2Sun as a social business as well as B Corp? And again, what is the difficulties you face when you start the B2Sun project and how to develop the project to this scale now? So um, when we began the project originally, we, we thought very much um, from a perspective of Ethiopia at the time. And we thought trade would be a better long-term agent of change um, than aid. So, um, so we ventured into setting up a business to produce lamps and to ideally retail them in some kind of um, sensible fashion. Um, that led us to micro-entrepreneurs and to figuring out how these units could move on the ground, but it also led us to look at the entire ecosystem. Um, so our target was um, from the beginning on impact. It was on delivering lamps and access to energy. You could say we, we wanted to also create like a planet positive endeavor, renewable energy, but, but also in general, uh, our terms of engagement. And we were interested in, in questions of, of circularity, both um, from the product perspective, but also from a social perspective. And so we looked into you know, what's happening in this world. We met quite early on people from Muhammad Yunus's um, network, the social business network. And, um, and we started to adhere to certain principles of social business. And then a bit later, we were introduced to the B Corp network. And we thought that that's quite interesting. In Germany, similar to here, I think B Corp is not a legal form. So it is more a commitment that we make. But um, it turned out everything we had done and, and, and really um, every opportunity we had, and this is similar to what you were saying earlier, everything is based on partnerships. It's based on finding great people to work with. And we've, through the project, met incredible people in the for-profit side, in the non-profit side, crazy ventures doing all kinds of things. And um, the fact that there are sort of unifying bodies for these great people, such as the B Corp movement, I think is interesting to me. We've also learned that we've created a symbol with our lamp, but um, how we were operating was still opaque to people at times. And there again, the B Corp movement in a certain way provides a, an explanation for that. So I can say we're a B Corp. That means I don't have to explain the whole B Corp thing anymore. People can go to the B Corp website or they already know about it. So in a way, I'm, I'm freeing more time to, to look at what is really important to us and specific to us. And in Germany now, um, B Corp is, I think, slightly larger than here, but still quite small compared to the US. But uh, we have a few great smaller companies and we do collaboration, super simple. Like we go to trade fairs together, so we share the cost for a booth. We, um, uh, there's one nice little B Corp called Clean Canteen, a US-based company. So with their German division now, we are doing a, a nice Clean Canteen bottle with Little Sun graphics on it, you know, for Christmas this year. So it's... Um, it's uh, on the one side, it's about definition, defining our entity. It's in a way also lobbying longer term um, for different potential regulations in, in Germany. And it's about having fun with friends. And one of the challenges to go to that part of the question that we've experienced is we are an impact project. We don't in our own terms really differentiate between what we do that is rather non-profit and what we do that is for-profit. We would like to be able to move funds freely between these um, two areas. 
In Germany, that's not so well accepted by the tax authorities because we don't, um, we don't have this uh, B Corp status as a legal, legal form. So what we have is we actually have a for-profit company in Germany that runs on all just regular business terms. And then we have a completely segregated non-profit that runs on grant funding and donations where we've, you know, also similar to you, we've, we've learned how to write grant applications for impact projects. Now, the reality in sub-Saharan Africa where light and energy are not available is that all projects are a blended finance model, essentially. Grant funding is needed to, to start things, to create opportunity, to train entrepreneurs, to, you know, to do things that could essentially in the long term even lead to scalable social business. Now, the German tax authorities, they don't really buy into that idea. For them, it's like give away a lamp that's non-profit or sell a lamp that is for-profit that our micro-entrepreneur partners in Sub-Saharan Africa aren't really generating a lot of profit but could rather really use more subsidy is completely alien to a tax uh, authority official sitting in Berlin. And so B Corp helps us a little bit to navigate that space and it's again a prospect of a better future. We've had a few really, really large companies like Danone, who is represented here also, join the B Corp movement. I think that's fantastic. Unilever, Patagonia, I mean, you know, big, big brand names. And the more this idea of, of social um, engagement can be translated to mainframe business, I think the better. And if we can create little beacons of, of hope for that, you know, with social businesses, NGOs, nonprofits that strive to use business principles for scale, I think that that will just create a better world. So we're, um, we're quite excited, not so much what, about what B Corp is immediately doing for us, but more about the prospect that it, uh, it projects. And being a part of that, pushing that movement, I think is interesting. And I think, you know, whether governmental agency, nonprofit, I think all of us together here believing in social business have, have this potential of advancing that whole cause. And, you know, this room just has to get fuller and it's a nice mix of small entities, large companies coming together. Thank you. So we still have 15 minutes. So I would like to open the floor. Any questions on the floor? Please raise your hand. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So please introduce yourself before asking the questions. Thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Kobe. I'm the founder of the Horseman Patch. Um, so um, so it was very interesting to know about the different ideas and designs from like Thailand, uh, Hong Kong, and um, Germany. So um, so the, my question is that like for Hong Kong, um, like gen like kind of because the, the, the way that we set out from the government and also there's a lot of limitations on like uh, educations and we have the lead of like sometimes creativities. So in some way that make us a little bit conservative. So uh, can you give us some advice or tips on um, like the designers or the social enterprise in Hong Kong that how they can design the products or services um, which is um, kind of under the pressure of limitations? Okay, so go first. Who will be the first one? Peter? I'm not so sure I understand the question 100%, but um, you mean that to, for social enterprise to come up with ideas, things that are more creative, things like that? Or? Yeah, just um, advice on how to create a product or services um, like for social enterprise. I think you have to find, I think it backs to the purpose of setting up the social enterprise first. What is the purpose? Maybe you have to question that first to narrow down things. And if you got that purpose, maybe when it falls down to things that, what should we do? Maybe you have to find the pain, like, things that people have in common that if you have this, things will be better. You will gain money, it will benefit the social, it, things like that. So I think it's mostly questioning yourself, the purpose, and what is the, the common, the mutual um, interest or pain or, or things that people need solutions to be delivered. So I think this is, it's not about creativity, actually, it's about questioning. Creativity is in a way, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful word, <laughs> but it's, 
maybe it's difficult for people to understand, but if you would like to clear it out easily, maybe just ask questions. If this is good, is this is better, is what is the things that we should do? I think that will come that will conclude in like a new service, new products, things like that eventually. And there will be other process stages that you will have to fight with is who will fund it, who will manufacture it, who will do it, things like that later on. But if it's a great project, people will come and help and try to benefit things. So it, it, it roll back up to the purpose and things that will help people. This is my point of view. So I think there is um, there's an interesting part in that question as to the, the reason why you create an enterprise. So we started our project because we were looking at, at impact, at solar-powered lamps for kids in rural areas without access to energy. Um, and then we're trying to find vehicles to, to make that happen. And we are ideally trying to find scalable vehicles, which is where business and then social business automatically comes in. What I think is interesting about the whole social business world and the B Corp movement is that there can also be companies whose primary primary mission is really to be a successful company in a certain industry or in a certain area, and then this entity can adapt social business principles. I would always argue there are certain basic um, you know, mission components to follow. So circularity, I think, is a really big topic in all kinds of questions on design and on products that you create. And you know, planet positive, you could argue, is, is, a big, is a big thing, which I think is important if we're looking towards the future. But of course, social business means so much more. It can be about community engagement. It can be about um, just not maximizing profits um, and dividends, but maximizing the reinvestment into, into a business that actually has positive implications for, uh, for the business, for the employees, and for the society it, it services. So I think the interesting part really is that um, if you have a fantastic idea for, I don't know, a new smartphone, for example, I'm sure there are always choices that you make along the way. So I think the, the questioning and the choices, I think that's a good point. You can make it more circular. You can use the profits for something um, that, that actually, you know, around your, your work and your profit creates impact. Or you can really address, like on our side, a, an, an actual bigger problem in the world and focus on that, which may not bring as much potential profits, but then you know, even the basic frame of operation is about, is about this impact. But I think all of these, you know, all the, and there are so many shades of gray along that way, all of these different things have, have their great value, but I think really questioning every step and applying the same principles and the same guiding principles, I think is really, really helpful. Mm. Um, I think it's very important is like, um, find the right people to do the right thing and find the right partners. And more important, if I just pick up um, a, a, a sentence from you is oh, how, how to approach for the government funding is because they might be very consultative, might not be um, accept very creative ideas. So don't go to the government, go to the private funders. Normally they are much more open. Okay, so once if your, 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 your trial project is successful, then you go to the government because they know that it's safe. So they will support you. So this is my sharing. Okay. So, any questions on the floor? Okay. Uh, I come from Poly Youth School of Design. Okay, I just want to ask questions about that. In Hong Kong, we feel the, we face the difficulty is, okay, our student is creative, <laughs> I think. <laughs> and the problem is the market is not to accept the creativity. They, uh, the way I thought, talked about is, uh, they want a 100 complete safe proposal. Okay, so I want to ask, okay, in Germany or in Thai, Thailand, okay, do you face the same problem or? a uh, little bit different from Hong Kong. So, um, probably somewhat similar depending on, on who you ask. So safety is, um, and you know, provability is a big thing. So for example, we started our project um, without really having funding in the beginning. Our first funding came from uh, Tate Modern um, for an exhibition that we did about Little Sun because Olafur had had the Big Sun project there, so they thought it would be great if the museum together with us would launch the Little Sun. 
as um, a part of the Olympic Games in London in 2012. The idea was, you know, everyone comes together around the Olympic torch in London. And as a cultural project on the side of it, we're making a tiny torch that everyone can take from London into the world. And this idea of the, the collective action was, was engaging to the museum. That led to us starting um, our social business. And then half a year or a year into it, we realized, oh goodness, we need much more money. So then we started looking for investment. And it was a bit of a challenge because um, investors we talked to, and this was all philanthropic impact investment, um, not commercial grade, everyone said, well, you've already started. We'll just wait another year and see how you're doing. And we almost died in that phase. And it turned out we should have gone to these potential investors or grant givers with a project without having started. We would have had an easier pathway to selling a vision because once we were on the way, they were kind of like, well, let's wait another cycle, let's wait for another production, let's wait for customer feedback, let's wait for this and, and that. So I think um, what I've learned is um, there is a, a, a huge array of money out in the world and, and it comes in, in very, very different um, forms. Um, standard investment, impact investment, grants, um, you know, philanthropy comes in, in, in various styles, private philanthropy, foundations. It's very different in Europe and in the US and in Asia. I think um, being able to adapt to that is, is really what's crucial. So I don't know the infrastructure here in, in Hong Kong or the environment, but I'm sure if you have a good idea here, I mean, look at the city, it's full of money. And people, at least in, in, in Europe, don't really know where to put their money because if you put it in a bank right now, you're getting 0.01% interest rate. And this is not a joke. I talked to a bank yesterday because um, my father is trying to figure out how to sort, sort his retirement out. And it's um, basically you have to pay the bank if you want to put more money there than my dad has, right? So um, the money is in abundance. And if you have a project that, that has a scope of not losing money, at least in Europe, you have a good chance of getting money for that. And if you figure out some kind of blended finance idea for that, and you can really create enthusiasm with people, I think there are, there are huge avenues right now of doing things. And the world is craving great projects. It's craving social business. Over the past six years, we've been doing Little Sun. In my perception, at least, the, the, you know, the availability of funds for social-driven projects has actually increased quite a lot. The awareness of this type of project has increased. The amount of... Um, of uh, people who have made billions has also increased, which kind of opens up for more philanthropic engagement, which could be just impact investment, which is basically people accepting more risk. But um, also traditional investment has become more risky. People have lost money on pension funds on all kinds of things. And so I think it's, it's about finding the right story to, to share with people and engaging people on the way and bringing them along. And I think one of the things where creativity you know, for designers, um, occasionally tends to stop a little bit, so they're focused on their project, but they're not necessarily always focused on the communication. This is where um, where companies and, and design can actually learn from, from the arts, because it's always about the communication. So the art center is it's exclusively about communication, you could say. As you said, it's not about products. And I think that for social business is also important. What we, for example, here, what I sell is a story. I don't sell solar-powered lamps. The solar-powered lamps are part of the impact. Those are the tools we use. But what I'm trying to sell when I go to a corporate to do a CSR project, when I go to a foundation to get a grant, or when I sell one of these in a museum shop, um, it, it's really our, our story and the fact that you can buy into supporting that story and having an impact together. Sorry, long answer. <laughs> For Thailand, I think actually it's the same. Um, people are afraid of new ideas that has not been proved. New idea that has not been proved. So to get people's support in the, the beginning, it's like you need, you need evidence, you need proof that it works, that it's good, that it's great. So if it starts from here, I believe it, it will step up eventually. There will be um, a bigger follower increasing in your service or your product. So I think this is part of, of getting bigger and growth of, of the, the scaling of, of the idea or product. So I, it, it, come back, it comes back to evidence and proof that is really good and to, to add on what Felix says, 
maybe you need to learn the elevator pitch. In three minutes, you have to tell the best thing that your idea is to people, and they bought it. So things like that, I think it's how you communicate the idea, the big idea that you're doing to people and buy in lots of people in a way. And I think that will support the project. If it's really good, it's, it will be great eventually. Connie, I know that Hong Kong Art Center also runs art schools. So what do you think about the situations? You mean it's on, on what part? It's about the creativity. Is the or creativity I, I think it's and the like, industry. Mm, um, I think like uh, arts and design are a bit different. I think uh, right now Hong Kong is the third art market. So um, a lot of, as whenever we have our graduation exhibitions, it's like a lot of galleries will come to spot our students already. So uh, quite a large percentage of our students have become full-time artists. Because right now, artists is not talking about selling a sculpture, selling a painting. They do all, all sorts of things. They can do public art and they can do like, a, they can go back to do design. So because a lot of the uh, art is about concept. So um, it's much more diverse. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, uh, I really want to add on for what Felix is sharing is uh, what we Hong Kong people need to learn is about storytelling. If you have a vision, if you have a plan, so you have to know how to use, just like you say, feminist is elevator pitching is, you have to tell a story and you have to have a vision so that people can really understand and grab it. And the other thing is, even you have a good story, but people are afraid, the failures. So you have to, either you use crowdfunding or use your own money, and you have to start it. If you don't start it, you never get it. Yeah. Okay, so one more question on the floor. Any questions? So, okay, thank you for all of you so, to join us. So, hope to see you again tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah.